Now, can everybody see that screen there? Okay. So the Hall 360 project. Oh, okay, here we go. So the Hood 360 project is a Queensland government funded project and BMP is for best management practice and GDR is for Great Barrier Reef. And so we use these acronyms quite a lot. And basically we are engaging, we, um, GROCOM is rolling out this project and we've got two full-time BMP facilitators to roll out the project. So that's myself based here in Bundaberg for the Southern Reef Catchment Regions and my colleague Lindsay Allen who's based up in Townsville and he's in the Northern uh, GBR region. The types of things that we're doing with this project is our remit is to uh, provide one, one assistance to horticulture growers to assist growers participate in the BMP which is a best management practice program um, and to uh, develop tools and run activities that will be of interest to them. Basically, we're trying to ensure that all of the content that we're running within our program is uh, grower-led and designed and on topics that are of interest to them. So soil health and biosecurity are two issues that have been raised with us um, over and over and so hence our webinar today uh, with J.D. Lee presenting on nematodes, biology and local research findings and indeed how to prevent spread of these through good bio biosecurity on farm practices. Um, other topics that industry have raised with us that they want more information on uh, is fair farms, uh, ag technology, weeds and pests. Um, and so in the last 12 months, we are only just uh, 12 months into our four year project. Uh, we have um, in the southern end of the GBR, we have run five workshops and held four field days. And then over the next three months, we're running this Zoom series as a bit of a trial. Um, we've got a bit of a calendar program of our Zoom session series um, set up. Now, some of the subjects are going to be subject to some massaging about the topics because um, we really are still in the process of just finalising the, um, the, the subjects, but um, our next Zoom uh, session will feature Emily Patterson from Total Grower Services, who is going to talk about the importance of scouting, integrated pest management and beneficial bugs. And then the next month on, the last Wednesday of October, Rhiannon Robinson and Luke Griffiths from the Department of Agriculture will be talking about how they're using and trialling bioreactors and sampling nitrates. Uh, and then our last Zoom session for the year the last Wednesday of November. Um, I thought it'd be a bit rough trying to uh, schedule one on the last Wednesday of December. I probably wouldn't get too many people signed in. But Lee Nudson from GROCOM is going to be, she's still scoping up her topic, but it will be around climate resilience or pre preparedness and, and some tools that are available for growers to assist them in being um, prepared and a little bit more resilient, resilient heading into that time of year. So um, best management practice is a it's, a, it's a program, it's a platform and a structure for which um, it, farmers can benchmark where their current farming practices are at. And so they are not new, they have been used by other industries for many years and in fact the cotton industry has been using their BMP for over 20 years now since 1997. Um, in this end of the Great Barrier Reef, so that's the Fitzroy and Burnett Mary catchment. Uh, 43 horticulture businesses have uh, completed a subset of the BMP, which is the reef uh, sub modules. And then 15 horticulture businesses, again, just in this southern end of the Great Barrier Reef, have completed a whole lot of other modules on topics such as energy, workplace health and safety, biosecurity, and so forth. And um, Lindsay and I, and also Scott Wallace based in Toowoomba, are available to help horticulture growers with them. And actually, while well, I do mention um, Lindsay and I, because we are tasked with this project, there are other Hort 360 facilitators based throughout Queensland, and Lynn Nudson is one of those facilitators, and then there's Roe Beverage based in Toowoomba. 
Um, so, uh, this is, yeah. so I'm just going to show you the front end of what the BMP looks like. Do a little quick check. There's been, uh, I'll just go back to that. That's okay. There's been a few ding-dongs, people coming in. So um, welcome to the um, people that have just signed in. Um, so I'm just going to show you, this is the front end of our BMP and this tool, this part of the BMP is available for anybody. It's, it's a website and so I'm going to take you into the website just to show you um, the, what, the, what that looks like. And of course, you know, good old Murphy's rule, anything that could go wrong does go wrong. Um, hang on a moment. I had a little problem with my Wi-Fi box. Can you believe it? About 15 minutes before the thing. Um, and I've never had any troubles with it before. <laughs> oh, well. Just, I'm just going to try this again. Okay, can you see that there, JD? Can you see? The slide? You can see that slide? Yeah, the yes. Hort 360? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so this is what the um, BMP website looks like. And what you need to do is just log in up in the top corner. And if you don't have a profile, you'll need to register for a profile. And this is where it comes down to, this part is only available for growers or horticulture, strictly horticulture industry. So I'll just log right in. And then we have our little demonstration. There we go, Growcom Australia. And this is what it will look like to someone wanting to do the BMP. So after they set up some specific information about their, their business, so company information, there's also some, um, some information that you can put in there about your commodities that you grow and how many hectares and so forth. Once you fill that in, then you can start doing a BMP. And so this is what each of the modules look like. And just for the sake of this topic, we'll go to the uh, biosecurity one and we'll click on, you can see that there's five components in the biosecurity BMP. So we'll go on to that first one there. And the first question there is about whether or not people have a biosecurity management plan program in place. So if they do not, we would click 100%. Then moving on to the next component, do you have an effective monitoring and reporting process? And basically it's just a process of selecting which responses best suit your business. Um, and so that's, that's it. We try to make it, take the sting out of the tail as much as possible. Gone are the days of all day long BMP workshops. Okay, so back to our slideshow here. Oh, the other thing about the BMP is that it can generate some fantastic data about existing land management practices. So this is something that I just put, to get, put together last night and this is about biosecurity on farm practices for horticulture growers in the Great Barrier Reef. And what this shows is that you can see the variation or the, uh, this is where all of the responses have been pulled in together into this thing here for management. And there's a proper word for that and Scott Wallace would be able to tell you, but I'm not really good on these mathematical and graphical descriptors, but these are the outlier response. So you've got, you've got some, one of the growers that did this, they're at the top, it was 95% for their practice in management. Um, and, but then at the lower end of the scale, you've got some growers here that may be at that lower end. Um, the smaller the box in the middle the, and the, is the smaller the variation. Um, and I'll be happy to talk to you about that later on. Okie doke. This is where I hand it over to Jodie Lee. Um, so Jodie Lee is, um, 
is doing a lot of work in nematodes um, in this region and has learnt from the best. And now, JD Lee, just got to bear with me while I work out. I've got to stop share. <laughs> okay. And Thanks. now I have to share. No, yeah. now I have to click on you. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So can everybody see JD's screen now? Yep, but Brian, you're nodding. Yep, excellent. Okay, good. Okay, oh, there's a chat, hang on. Yeah, for, for someone on the phone couldn't, like John couldn't see the slides, don't worry. I will send you a, a, a PDF of all the slides to Michelle so you could get a copy from Michelle. I'm happy for sharing the slides with all of you. Thank you, JD. Yeah. So I'm okay to start? Yes, over to you, JD. Yeah, I got uh, 26 slides, so <laughs> I try to talk quickly and then we'll finish. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm JD Nee, based at the Central Queensland University, Bound Bay Campus, uh, doing uh, most of the uh, research on nematode management. So today I will uh, thank uh, Michelle for the opportunity to uh, give you some introduction about plant prosthetic nematodes. This is my outline of my slides uh, this evening's presentation. Firstly, we will have uh, some background information, especially about the biology. So these things uh, we possibly need to get a little bit knowledge about that and then we come to how we manage our nematodes in our paddocks because this is very important why we take a different strategy in different environment. So uh, the last thing is I, we have done a lot of research on different crops like sweet potato, pineapple and ginger. So I picked some uh, few cases study to, to, to combine with today's uh, main information about uh, the biosecurity topic. Uh, firstly, uh, I think um, the, the reason why so many people are interested about nematodes is about the uh, plant prosthetic nematodes damage on the on our crops. But uh, in fact, in the world, there are, uh, there are many, many of nematode species and uh, individuals in the world. So give a quick example is if you just uh, grab a hand of uh, soil, in any paddocks or, or forest or um, other uh, land, yeah, there will be uh, something like you could pick, you will get the opportunity to pick 10 to 15 genus of the nematodes, not including species, definitely um, genus will be, have different species. So the species number will be over that. And uh, some, so the reason why these nematodes get um, so many nematodes in our soil. I, um, personally, I come here is uh, for all the nematodes, not all of them are bad nematodes. In fact, most of them are good. So I'll give you a quick, uh, quick photo introduction is what the nematode, plant prosthetic nematodes looks like compared with the good ones. So the plant prosthetic nematodes Usually they have a very strong style net. In the first photo, they could punch the style net into the plant roots to, to broke in the plant cell, make damage on the crops. But for other nematodes, like some nematodes eating bacteria, fungi, or even eating the bad plant prosthetic nematodes, we call the beneficial predatory nematodes, they usually have don't have this strong style net. Instead that they have the other um, other tools or some other part of mouse to, to, to feed on other uh, microorganisms. So they are ben beneficial ones. So usually if you go to soil, if you pick the bad one, and also they have a good one there. And uh, the reason why nematodes is so widely distributed in our global world, uh, including our soil, because the nematode, for most nematode size, uh, including the plant prosthetic nematodes, they are quite small. Uh, if you could see this picture the, uh, on, on the right side of the screen, there is a plant cell picture. 
So on the top, there's a plant prosthetic nematode head, and they they get the head into the plant cell. So you could see the proportion. This uh, the diameter of the head usually is 15 to 35 microns, and the whole body length I will show later in another picture is varied from 250 to 3,000 microns. The whole body length. So it's quite small. Usually we couldn't uh, identify that and found the nematodes in our soil through our naked eyes, not so big like the ass worms or other mites we could easily to see um, yeah, in the soil. We need to, that's the reason why we need to research and identify in the lab, see that and under the microscope. Uh, that's a picture of different plant prosthetic nematodes, the shapes and body lengths. So something like on the right side of the picture, that's some uh, mature stage of different plant prosthetic nematodes. Like the bottom uh, one is a sister nematode, and the, uh, from the bottom a second is uh, do not nematode. So when they are juvenile, they are the uh, thread like but when they come to mature stage, they did become like a pregnant woman, get a big stomach. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, to, of the uh, plant roots with different type of plant prosthetic nematodes. So different nematode, plant prosthetic nematodes, they, they have different um, uh, life, cy life cycle. So some could get into the get into the roots and stay there forever, like the root not nematodes. Once they get a mature stage, they stay in the roots and uh, won't move. But some is like a root niche nematodes. Even the whole body get into the roots, they could keep moving into the through the roots. That's the reason why some root niche nematodes in West Australia, like uh, they uh, attack the weight you could find in the weight roots they are they keep moving through the uh, roots bottom could go to the top but not above ground the the, the plant stems uh, this is i pick the, uh, the 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 main one the root knot nematodes uh, give you some idea about how the nematodes uh, the knife cycle like looks like uh, here is some, the brown, the brown color is the soil particles, uh, the yellow part is the plant roots. So, so you could see the, see the plant, uh, we start from the eggs, some mature nematodes start to lay the eggs and then these eggs lay into the soil. So when every, they get good moisture and temperature, these eggs could hatch into juvenile. In juvenile, they have four stages. Usually for root nematodes, the second juvenile is the most active one. So they keep moving and uh, until they find the uh, host plant, so they get into the roots through the strong salad. And then they move into the roots, get uh, another third and fourth juvenile stage developed until they come Uh, woman, so they stay there on the move and then uh, start to lay eggs. So one nematode, they could lay uh, 500 to 1,000 of eggs. So that's a very, uh, that's a reason why usually you start from very low population and get a high population at the harvest time because the multiplication is quite high. Uh, here is some quick introduction because uh, Michelle submitted uh, a list of different crops um, that people want to register this conference. So I picked some uh, some crops in the red uh, bucket. So you could see this is some uh, 2015. Some people did a statistic and analyze and get average. So it's a is a, uh, the whole world the average. So especially compared with our Bundaberg good area horticulture sub. Uh, horticulture sub subtropical and tropical area is quite low, so you can see different crops and what's the yield loss uh, is the average level. And for the whole 
whole global world is we could account this uh, yield loss caused by nematodes if change into money, it could be 157 billion. So it's quite a lot. So nematodes is a global problem, it's not Australia. And uh, uh, here are some, for someone who haven't seen the, um, how to identify the nematodes in your paddock, here is some picture I picked from my, um, our research uh, uh, experiment. So, so, so for the uh, below ground symptom, because most, uh, we do have some nematodes who could attack to the plant leaves and make damage, but in Australia it's not very common. Most uh, is uh, start from the soil damage of uh, plant roots. So I only pick the below ground symptoms of the plants infected by different nematodes. Like they could uh, get excess, uh, excessive root branching. So uh, carrots is a good sample. And uh, another one is suppressing the root growth. So like a pineapple in the uh, second picture is a pineapple. A picture is uh, damaged by the roots. So you could say some, so the roots is uh, stopped further development because they get into the root tip and then the root tip uh, stop the root tip keep growing. So in the soil, so when you get into roots and you compare with healthy one, it's, it started with a very short roots in your soil. And the root needles is like a banana and uh, uh, wheat. If you pick the roots, maybe hard to say, but if you come back to the nap, chop them, sometimes get some uh, dilution by different uh, chemicals, you will see the, uh, the, the plant, the root needle nematodes in the roots. And the root discoloration and the root gorning. Root gorning is easy to see on the tomato or capsicum, some uh, horticultural crops, even carrots. So usually tomato is uh, a good host for, for, for a lot of um, root, root not nematode species. So we usually use them to, to culture our pure, get our root not pure culture. So this is uh, the last picture is the uh, tomato roots and uh, uh, get plenty of root not nematode spores in the, in the root system. The first uh, one is a sweet potato. Is uh, is they show some uh, nature or only infection by the nematodes. So we come to the biology and then come to your paddocks. We, I think, uh, most people are concerned. What's the key environment factor affect uh, um, our nematodes multiplication and? Uh, so here I pick the top three, but they maybe have some others and uh, may vary in the condition. That's the top three is if we read the books and usually they pick this uh, top three. And uh, the first thing is the soil texture. So if you saw you get the uh, nematodes, usually in the, they will make more damage in the uh, sand texture soil and marked soils. And than the uh, clay soils. So it's a little bit different with uh, root needle nematodes because root needle nematodes in the uh, clay soil, dining dance areas uh, is quite high, even the soil is clay. Uh, this thing I will combine to some uh, experimental results, give you some idea. Um, and soil moisture is another one because uh, when the soil is dry, the nematodes want to die. That's, a, that's an issue. The population, some die like juvenile or females, but the eggs, they could uh, survive. So that's the reason why, why you, once you get the nematodes in your, the bad nematodes in your soil, it's hard to get rid of them because uh, even the soil is very dry, they won't die. Some eggs could survive until they get a good soil moisture and then they will recover and uh, uh, hatch into juveniles, but when the soil is dry, they won't move. They keep in active stage. So uh, that's the reason sometimes if you keep fennel for a few months, the nematodes will, population will drop very low. And uh, another thing is the soil temperature. For different nematodes, they have a different suitable temperature for the life cycle. 
So usually, like for runot nematodes, take three to five weeks to finish a whole life, cy cy uh, life cycle from the eggs to, uh, to juvenile and the female and then come back to eggs. But this varies, uh, depends on the soil temperature. So for root knot nematodes, the best temperature, the, the favorite temperature is 24 to 32 degree. So that's the reason why uh, like Bandberg region is uh, like a nematode capital because it's very good temperature through the whole year for for the um, nematode to hatch. Yeah, even we get some winter but and uh, a hot summer, but uh, not very long. This uh, most uh, air, most of the time through the year is a uh, very good temperature for do not nematodes to multiply and uh, live in the soil. And they do have some threshold for uh, do not nematodes development, uh, change uh, hatch or or moving. And for different species, uh, is um, they got a little bit of variation. So like for our um, some warm climate species, especially for Bangladesh area, like if the temperature lower than five or fifteen degree, or in the summer the soil temperature is high over thirty eight degrees, the nematodes want um, want to keep 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 active and uh, attack to the roots because they they become to struggle to 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 survive. Uh, JD, just yeah. wondering if you could go back to that slide. Yeah. I just thought that would be a good space to ask if anybody has any questions for JD about that environmental factor um, and also what uh, Jody was talking about before with how quickly they reproduce. Um, just remember to unmute the, that yourself on the bottom left hand side. Any questions for JD? No. Okay. No, um, you, can, you can start the thinking questions. I will um, hmm. talk in that. Yeah. Thanks, JD. Yeah, combine with some case studies. So uh, I give a quick slide is to a list of the whole um, the, the main nematode management options. And on the top, uh, the red color is more sustainable and uh, uh, environment friendly options. And the uh, bottom, the black color, the, the, the bottom three, you know, is quite common, but uh, uh, you, you must realize it's also is less friendly, environment friendly, and uh, it's more toxic. But uh, I understand some some cases we we, we have to use the chemicals and the fumigants. Yeah, but uh, I was talking uh, combined with the case study said um, when we apply the uh, chemicals, what things we need to to, to, to pay attention. Uh, oh. JD, um, Tony Felipe had a question. Yeah. About what depth is the most prolific numbers of nematodes found? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, varies through crops, uh, but most of the, because like uh, most uh, hot culture vegetables, because the root system is uh, zero to the most uh, root system is uh, the high numbers of root biomass is on the top of zero to thirty centimeters. So the that's the highest uh, root like nematodes, plant parasitic nematodes numbers get higher on. Uh, and after three uh, centimeters, no and then you will still have some, but the population will drop. So really depends on how, uh, what's, which crop you plant in. Like uh, previously, we, we, we do research on root niji nematodes on weight. So the weight system could go uh, with one meter underneath. So we take different uh, depths from zero to uh, 100 or well, one meters. So we found that in fact that the 30 to 45 could be the highest in some cases. So rain depends on crop. But uh, if you're like a pineapple, sweet potato or ginger, other hot culture crops, I suppose the root system will be uh, most uh, intensive in the top 30 centimeters. That's the uh, area you need to treat on to, to control your nematodes on. Yeah. Thanks, JD. Good question, Tony. Thank you. 
maybe I give an expand, uh, expand, uh, expand, explanation on these uh, different strategies. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is a uh, quarantine. So is a uh, is with this topic biosecurity. Quarantine is a uh, uh, is a very is a top one. So from the NIST, when you manage your farms, the first thing you maybe need to think about is quarantine. Anything uh, once you get nematodes is a uh, very difficult to control uh, because the the, the 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 control manager every time is varies. It depends on your which crop and the things you need to make uh, uh, good options. So. It's a very complex decision, uh, but the first thing for the quarantine is like uh, the reason uh, why I introduced the biology is because the nematode is quite small, just like bacteria, fungi, or imagine similar as a virus. If anyone come to your farm and walk there, or even use the hand to touch the soil, if they don't wash it and go back to their paddocks, your 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 hand could 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 have the the nematode eggs stick in your hands. So that's a, that's, a, that's a reason why we need to keep the quarantine. And the biosecurity is quite important in your, uh, in your farm because once you get the, uh, your nematodes, it's very hard to get rid of it. Do not nematodes is the top one uh, in the world. Uh, but uh, as what we uh, did a survey on is some survey results showed for something like Rockhampton is Queensland area, but uh, not uh, not not every paddock they have the rule not name toes. So that's the reason I go to Rockhampton. I told them the biosecurity for me is is a key one for them to to keep uh, keep rule not name toes out of the paddock because once they get it, they maybe uh, totally spend the energy to 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 focus on how to control the rule not name toes. And another thing is a diagnosis or monitoring. So these things, if you get your uh, the the, the nematodes, uh, the root knot nematodes or other plant parasitic in, in your paddocks, that means the, the the first thing is like do the pre-planting something to to get the all the species you have, and then what's the um what's the pre-planting population, and then you know which crops threshold level, so you could make a decision whether I go to the this crop or not. So help you to make your uh, management options. And uh, clean planting material is seen as a biosecurity, quite important. The, for the root nematodes and other soil plant preceded nematodes, they won't come to uh, your uh, above ground uh, plant by themselves, but sometimes maybe uh, you have some soil and then coming particles come into the top your planting material like sweet potato or pineapple this maybe could uh, including some um, contamination so give them a good wash because uh, the, 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 the you don't want to take the high risk and another thing is a resistant tolerant uh, uh, variety this is a very good option but uh, for some uh, in some condition, uh, I totally understand why you couldn't choose that next like sweet potato because um, people still want the, um, the old variety. And, uh, but this has been uh, applied a lot in the broad acre crops like wheat. Crop rotation uh, is another one, but you need to, uh, based on your diagnosis, because uh, different uh, crops, the resistance is, um, to different species. For example, some sorghum may be resistant to, uh, to, to, to one species of root nematodes, but they are the good host for other species of root nematodes. So it's uh, make, make it grow, so get confused. Maybe they had some consultant who said, oh, this sorghum is good for uh, resistant for root nematodes, but when they plant it, they still get a high population. But the, 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 uh, the casing is, they do um, come into species level. So that's something when you're uh, looking for the consultation, you may be better to check it online because they do have plenty of uh, material on, on the Google system. You could find out which crop are resistant to which species. And organic inputs uh, is a is good one to uh, keep your soil good health. So, because we've got beneficial organisms in the soil like predatory nematodes and mice, they could 
reduce your uh, plant parasitic nematodes population. But after uh, many years cropping, your health system may be very poor. So this may be take a long time to get a good uh, control e uh, efficiency in your paddock. So that's something, um, yeah, the growers maybe don't have time to waiting for, for so long. And uh, biocontrol is, uh, is, or, is always a, a lot of research you keep working on. They want to get a high efficiency as a chemicals, but sometimes for the no population planting, uh, pre-planting uh, nematode levels, you maybe could think about to take some um, authentic choice. And uh, the uh, next one is a fumigant and the nematicides. These are the key one and to help the growers survive because uh, they do want to keep, keep the income. Uh, but this is just to have two things to think about is uh, when you apply the fumigants or nematicides, better not keep using the single one always in the same paddock because this will cause the biodegradation. This already happened for uh, Nemeke in some uh, cooling area. And, uh, and uh, now Nemeke dropped from the, uh, from the market. There are some new chemicals, com uh, side chemical product coming, but with, even they get a very good efficiency at the beginning because they are the new chemicals, so you never use it, of course they will get, give you the good efficiency. But whether, if you keep applying the single, rely on the single uh, the, the chemicals, that put your farm, uh, farm on the high risk. If one thing is a biodegradation, the efficiency after many years, they maybe keep dropping. And then another one is, what about if these chemicals dropped uh, from the market, like name care, and uh, what you can do? So, so this is something for the fumigants and the nematicide applying, you maybe need to think about. And uh, the next one is sonorization. It's um, simple, it's use the heating uh, principle because nematodes usually like if you get a soil temperature over 40 or 60 degrees, nematodes will die. And, uh, but, 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 but I would say some eggs still could uh, survive. And even some nematodes, like they could, the, the highest population maybe live in the top 30 centimeters, but some nematodes could, could go to no uh, deeper, especially when the topsoil gets uh, very hot. So it won't kill all the plant uh, prosthetic nematodes, but it will uh, kill some and also the beneficial one. So if this heating effect disappeared and uh, how you could, um, keep control your plant parasitic nematodes population? That's the question. And bethanol is a uh, uh, nest uh, cost for some growers, but uh, uh, sometimes it's easy to apply <laughs> because you don't need to do anything. But the, the thing is um, you need to keep a good weight management because some weight are good host for plant parasitic nematodes as well. And another thing is uh, you also get uh, a lot of beneficial organisms starving as, and dying as well at the same time. So uh, now I come with uh, three case studies. I gave a quick uh, introduction because I ran out of time already finished. So uh, these things is some, uh, uh, because when we start sweet potato uh, research, there's no threshold level identifies. So we start some soil uh, port experiment to to check the threshold level in two typical types of soil in Bangabag region. One is a red soil, another is a gray sand soil from uh, North, Bang North Bangabag. So uh, this is um, most uh, vegetables, the threshold level is uh, between one to 10 do not nematodes per 200 milliliters soil. So we want to check whether sweet potato uh, is fit in this area. Uh, so that's the two soils we tried, and then we get some analyze, pick the uh, threshold level. For the uh, gray sandy soil, is um, quite low, uh, even a little bit under one nematode. Uh, the juvenile, yeah, uh, do not nematode juvenile per 200 millimeters soil. This is a red soil, is come a little bit higher, but uh, I would say for, uh, for sweet potato, is about one uh, nematode per 200 millimeters soil. 
So uh, from this uh, research, the the key conclusion is you could see the, how the soil type varies and the threshold will uh, vary. So this result is uh, give it, if come back to one sentence, uh, I would say like if if you have paddocks in uh, both have the red soil and the gray sandy soil, if they got the same nematodes, similar nematodes pre-planting um, population, the gray sandy soil, uh, you will see more uh, the higher yield damage on your sweet potato than the red soil. And uh, for pineapple, I think for someone already came to some pineapple workshop, this is some background information I would repeat here, is uh, pineapple already uh, people did uh, more research uh, than sweet potato. So if you take the uh, some good sampling strategy uh, with one paddock, you better take a uh, 650 core at least, because sometimes if you only take two or three, you maybe get less chance to pick the uh, population and then you come back to uh, couldn't represent your uh, whole paddock uh, population very well. Another key one is the damage threshold for pineapple because you, most of pineapple growers uh, uh, would like to get a rotten crop. So the, uh, the threshold for the rotten crop is when you get the um, first crop planting at the 12 months is uh, Already, you take a sample if the population is um, is above to one to five or over that uh, nematodes per two hundred millimeter soil. That means they have indication in your raton crop. You will get a high chance to lose the thirty to sixty percent um, yield. So this is some uh, some uh, field trials running by. Uh, by uh, growth in um, pineapple paddocks. And uh, so they just uh, uh, get the genome and uh, also the uh, control. So treatment applied in the uh, same paddock. So we, we get involved to take some samples at uh, uh, three months after, after planting. But uh, the first crop before we went there, the first crop uh, before planting, they already uh, have few months of fennel period. So, so that, that could be an indication the pre-planting nematodes population could be very low. And uh, we take the soil samples at three months and uh, 10 months after uh, planting. So uh, we take the soil at uh, zero to 30 centimeters. So we suppose uh, that's the uh, most uh, nematodes population would be. Uh, this is the results uh, for our nematode counting. So we identified the root knot nematodes and also other plant prosthetic nematodes and also the beneficial, other beneficial um, uh, nematodes we call free needing. Wow. So from, yeah, from this, uh, Table you could see at three months, uh, the zoonotic not nematodes, even after they get a good host plant, the population is still quite low. Uh, that means uh, for the pre planting, that would be even lower than that. So for Tino and, uh, and uh, control, there's no difference because the population is quite low. Uh, but for the other plant prosthetic nematodes like uh, root nigen and other uh, nematodes, they do other free living nematodes as well. The Tino did have a show the efficiency could control the reduced the nematodes population compared with the control. But after three months planting, there's no any uh, difference in the nematode density among three groups, other root nematodes and uh, whole other plant prosthetic nematodes group or free living. But for free living, the groups did change. I will talk a little bit later. So what that means to, to us, so Tino could definitely could reduce your nematodes population, both bad one and good one. But how long this efficiency could keep in your soil, whether it's enough for your crops. For some crops, like a sh just two or three months is maybe enough. But for pineapple, that means 10 months is uh, they won't protect 
until 10 months after your first crop. So, but your threshold for your next raton crop is a 12 months area is already over that threshold level. So even the first crop, you start with a very low population at 12 months, is, it would be recovered to, to high, high than threshold level, even with the Tino application. So whether we really need to apply Tino in which uh, situation we apply, that would be a big question for, for growth to think about. And, uh, and uh, the last thing I would say, the free living nematodes numbers, the whole number, uh, it didn't uh, change, still similar between the control and the Tino treatment. But when we look at, uh, we did find higher predatory nematodes in the control than the Tino, because uh, uh, the predatory nematodes, they have a big body size. So once they get uh, damaged, the population reduce, it take longer for the good one to recover. But for the bad one, because you get a, a very good condition, good host plant and the food source for them, so they could recover quicker, much quicker than the beneficial one. So even we got a small amount of beneficial in your soil because, um, because the, 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 the effect of the fumigants, the, the good one won't be enough to, uh, control, to control your bad one. So that's the reason we need to extra uh, method or options uh, practice to, to keep the bad one population in the low level. And also there are some, uh, always some soil fungi and in this paddock they do have some very good bacteria we call pasturia in the last picture. This is some very, um, because they only attack uh, the, the bad do not name toes, they won't attack your beneficial one, but this one is very hard to culture. Now we are doing research how we could maintain the, uh, this one population in the soil. And uh, here is some good beneficial uh, organisms in the soil which could uh, kill the plant prosthetic nematodes, uh, mites and a different type of fungi and uh, the bacteria like pasturia and also the predatory nematodes. So uh, the last case studies is some research funded by Australian government uh, to, to, for us to do some research, we extracted some uh, native to beneficial soil nematode trapping fungi from our Queensland soils, and then we make them into the granule, like the fertilizer size. So we applied into the soil, and then uh, planted the ginger uh, inside to see um, how the uh, this bi biological product could uh, help us to reduce the uh, uh, nematodes population and protect the ginger. Here is some uh, data, uh, so different assessment on the soil root knot nematodes and also the root nigens, uh, the, the, the damaged nigens on the ginger roots. So we could see for the uh, two types of different nematode trapping fungi product AD and AO, and they get a significant less root knot nematodes in the soil and also the damage on the uh, ginger roots. Even it's not, yeah, it's not uh, um, as high as the chemicals, but they, they, they sometimes could work. So this, uh, we hope in the future we could provide some more options for growers to choose for some high levels, definitely no, problem you have to go with uh, chemicals, but whether some uh, lower population of the uh, pre-planting nematodes to start, you could uh, have, uh, have more options to choose. So here are the three uh, take home message I want to deliver for today's presentation. Hope you could uh, take, uh, have a think about that. The first thing for nematode management, I think, the key one is biosecurity. There's no uh, doubt with that, uh, how to pretend, prevent uh, the, the new plant prosthetic nematodes coming into your soil is the key one, especially for root nematodes for some growers. If some growers from uh, Rockhampton or from other, you haven't found the, uh, the root nematodes or other 
uh, plant parasitic nematodes, you must uh, protect your land. And another one is a chemicals control. There's no doubt chemical play a very good, uh, important role in your, um, to sustain our yield. We need to keep that, but since the, 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 the options are very limited and we keep losing some K1, we have to learn from this nothing. For the current available chemicals, what's the, in which condition, uh, we have to use it in which condition is not necessary to use that and also how and when i think for uh, especially for pineapple growers is uh, whether we could find some options to to control our nematodes reduce our nematodes population during cropping area especially for in the key area 12 months after first crop to protect our rattan crop is a key one and uh, uh, the next thing is um, also think about uh, whether there's some other sustainable um, IPM pest uh, management options for you to combine in your uh, the whole farm management uh, practice. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be some one uh, you could think about. Yeah. Actually, JD, there's a question just on that. So really yeah, yeah. great segue. Um, with a bare fallow, the question is, with bare fallow, would you plant mustard plants as a biofumigant for this stage to lower numbers? Uh, so, so the question is, uh, for the bare fallow, whether it's keep bare fallow or plant some biofumigant crops, is that right? If that sounds like it. Um, okay. That came from Tony. Okay, uh, I would say that uh, is, yeah, we we prefer to have some crop in the soil if you can instead of bare fennel because bare fennel it didn't cost you anything, but whether uh, you plant some crop maybe get a, a higher yield uh, coming back compared with the bare fennel. There are some uh, experiment for sugar cane; they get a results even you. Uh, reduce the cost for bare fennel, but uh, instead uh, bare fennel, you're planting some food crop, maybe could increase your next crop's yield. So this is something we encourage people to, to if they can, they plant something rather than bare fennel. But for the biofumigant crop, I know the, uh, uh, some are very good cover crops could, um, could reduce the uh, nematodes because they are resistant to nematodes and uh, I haven't done research, but uh, for 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 some some re for some research, they get a, a good effect to after combine incorporate these uh, biofilming crops into the soil, they get a good control efficiency. But some researchers they said they don't, so there's a argument between that. But uh, for the soil health, definitely plant crop is good. Uh, the last thing said about biofuming crop, I must uh, say, not all of uh, biofuming crops are resistant to root knot nematodes. You better to, before planting, you need to check uh, if you want to control root knot nematodes, especially you know which species. You better to go with the biofuming crop nest to find which uh, nematode species they are resistant because not all of them are host. Are, are resistant to rule of nematode species. Mm -hmm. Good question. We've got another question, JD. Yep. What effect does pH have on root knot nematode? Uh, pH for the current uh, soil, um, because uh, in fact, I have a project running at this moment in Bundaberg area. I picked the soil pH and also carbon and not of uh, 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 soil properties and try to identify the key environment uh, factor for for nematodes in specific environment. But I didn't find the soil pH has uh, too much effect on the on the root knot nematode po population during the cropping uh, here uh, period. My explanation is pH is due some uh, key one when you um, search Google. But in our soil, I think especially for the uh, soil, I take samples uh, from the Bundberg area, the pH possibly, they have a range, this range, uh, during this range, they won't have too much effect on the nematodes only. 
and connect the temperature until the threshold level, they close to the threshold level, it will make uh, the, the, the big difference. So it really depends on environment. If we get a soil pH data, yeah, that would be uh, something you, you could think about. I will try to get these results to uh, finish by this year and then submit a report. So hopefully you will see the results. Yes, yes, watch this space. Does anyone else have any more questions for JD? You could just, you don't have to type it, you could unmute and ask the question direct. Hmm. And also, I, I need my email there. I saw that the time is very limited <laughs> uh, by 40 minutes. If um, okay. later you, 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 you remember some question, happy to, 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 I'm happy to answer by email. Just send me uh, the email list because, um, yeah, sometimes I face the bump bag and happy even could go there to have a look. Thank you, JD. And yes, um, we are just ticking over time now, which is breaking the golden rule of running webinars. JD, could you just um, stop sharing your screen with me and I will just finish off. If, um, if you've got questions, please just type them through. Um, so now I'm going to do that. It's quite stressful running these webinars, you know. <laughs> um, oh dear. Okay. So, um, with regards to resources for pest, biosecurity pests and diseases, um, I failed to say before that the, um, the BMP is not just a benchmarking tool, it is packed with a load of resources. And um, when you delve into the BMP, there are little icons through it and you can click on those and, and get some valuable resources. For your participation and commitment to our webinar, our Hort 360 Zoom session, as the hipsters call it, um, well, I've got a pest pack which I will send to you. And um, in that pest pack is, it will be an excellent resource called Soil Borne Diseases Handbook, which has been developed by AHR. I also have some weeds of Southeast Queensland, sorry, that'll be no good to the guys in WA, but also some resources on vertebrate pets, pests, which are handy because I know growers are having problems with pig, wild pigs and things like that in their macadamias. Also, I've got a download, downloadable biosecurity action plan, um, which I can help you fill in. I can do that over the phone or we could do this that one-on-one -on, -one on farm or even through a, web, uh, a Zoom session like this. So um, that will be on your way. Now, I, I do have your um, your contact details from your registration process, but I am going to send an evaluation link through you through to you um, later in the week. So if you could please take five minutes to do that evaluation, then pop your address in there and, um, and I will post your pest pack to you. Um, but um, I think just, you know, everyone will get a pest pack. I'm not, I don't have anyone over a barrel by doing the evaluation for the pest pack. I'd just like to say thank you so much to JD um, and CQ University for their ongoing support to our program and, and taking time to do this at a, later, at a later time slot as well. Thank you very much, JD. Big round of applause. We do a virtual round of applause for JD. Um, also uh, to um, uh, the Queensland Government for their support through the Reef Water Quality Program and our corporate sponsors. And just to finish up on a, on a good note, I found this meme. It's very hard to find a meme about nematodes, but I'll keep looking for you. But anyway, I thought this was a bit of a funny testing. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining tonight. I'm just going to check one more time if there's any more chat. Um, oh, I already responded to. And it, yes. Yeah, they just ask uh, well, what magnification we um, could find the nematodes. I said uh, under microscope, we usually count under four and ten or ten. Yeah, to okay. easy to see them. For identifications, for some uh, very hard identified uh, species or genus, we could go through 40 or even 100. Yeah, but with a normal uh, microscope, if you got a four or ten, it's easy to, 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 to count. and. Uh, Okay, and I've just realised because I'm sharing my PowerPoint, that's why I can't see the yeah. the chat. So I'll get out of that. See if there's any more chats there. Um, 
No, oh, hang on. Oh, yes, JD, you've got onto that magnification. Yeah, yeah. Are yeah. you there with those? Yeah, I already answered. Yeah. Oh, did, but, uh, and everyone can see them. Okay, excellent. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the feedback. Thank you for coming. And um, I hope to see you at the next Talk 360 Zoom session. That's it for now. Good night. Thank you, Michelle. Bye. Thank you, Bye.